Cheers, guys. Epix 911. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 14th, 2017 edition of VR News. Gonna start tonight's show with two gaming updates. The first, Paranormal Activity. Talked about this game last week. This is the survival horror game that was uh, announced as coming out for both the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive via Steam VR. Well, it launched today. It's in early access, but according to the devs, you're going to be able to finish the game from start to finish. The only thing they're going to do different for the full retail release is add more of everything. Content, AI, textures, enemies, etc. So you get a lot more. Currently, 15% discount. So it's available for $39.99 US. Again, Paranormal Activities on Steam VR. Next game, Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown. This, this game, according to those who've tried the VR version, and that's only available for the PlayStation VR, they said it's easily up there as one of the best, if not the best looking PlayStation VR game. And we know there's definitely some stunning titles out there, so that's really good to hear. Again, launching on three platforms, Xbox One, PC, and PlayStation 4, only VR via PlayStation VR. So everyone else, unfortunately, is going to have to wait. But that is Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown, releasing sometime this year at a uh, price yet to be determined. Next story, Oculus doing something a little out of character, and I mean that halfway in jest, publishing CAD files for their touch controllers very detailed, almost blueprint level drawings of the touch controllers. Every little component is part of this CAD file collection. Now, the idea here is for third-party manufacturers to create accessories, hybrid accessories, like the Rock Band adapter, which I should have up in a picture here. So they're basically including all the details, the measurements, the battery compartment, so that you can ultimately make something that looks, you know, at least visually appealing as an end product. They're calling this documentation the Touch Accessories Guidelines 1.0. With that version number, likely there'll be some more updates. You can find out more about that at the Oculus Developer website. That's also where this is available for download. Next story, DRAC. Research raises $4.8 million to build a superior virtual reality audio. Now, what they're trying to do is improve audio to the point you will not notice you're wearing a headset. Now, it's a little technical. I had to read it a few times because I'm no audio expert, but they are utilizing what they're calling HRTFs, and that acronym stands for Head-Related Transfer Functions. And what those functions do is they take into account the isolated movements of your head in relation to your torso, like your midsection, and how audio waves bounce. So, for example, they use an example of a phone ringing. So it rings to your left, the sound wave enters your left ear, and a fraction of a second later, it emerges from your right ear, bounces off your shoulder, etc. All of that complex action and behavior that happens to audio waves is taken into account through software to some degree. And they're hoping that that is going to be a powerful enough solution to make people forget they're even wearing a headset. So hopefully this isn't one of the casualties. Hopefully these guys, uh, you know, can finish this and we see that capability somewhere. Either way, this looks like a very promising intellectual property. So definitely wish these guys success. Next story, Scene Fusion, bringing multi-user development to Unity's editor VR. This is a really interesting story. I talked about Unity's VR editor back on December 14th on that episode, and the functionality was pretty neat at that time. Well, a company called Kinematic Soup this week has announced 
full integration between them and the editor VR. So any of the 6,000 plus people that have already downloaded the software in its alpha state can access this new tool. And basically their claim to fame is to allow multiple people to collaborate in real time in multiple ways. And they say, think of it like multiplayer VR as you're actually making your game using position track controllers, users can intuitively build a scene together. Now this next one, I'm not gonna over exaggerate and say it blew my mind, but it is such an awesome concept made completely possible only because of virtual reality. And what I'm talking about is not only can two people enter VR together to edit the scenes with each other, but listen to this. One person could go into VR while the other works on the game from a traditional screen. And they are describing this as the out of VR developer doing big picture work while the in VR developer does detail work and provides feedback. Imagine not only being able to make adjustments to 3D objects, audio in real time, but have somebody that can comment on that, that can actually experience that in parallel in real time. Just amazing because think about it, literally up until VR, all development has essentially been on a flat screen. And the way you view that 3D world is completely different than when you're actually in it. So all kinds of amazing potential there. I think it could just add to games. You get the right team together in VR with vision, right? With directing ability, just kind of in their gene pool. The stuff they're gonna be able to do because they're gonna be able to manipulate that game world as if they were in a movie. You, again, just can't do that with a flat screen in the same way. Next story, the Kronos Group uh, has stated today that they would welcome input from Microsoft on their OpenXR standard. Now, talked about these guys and the list of people on board is massive. More on that in a second. As they see it, the group, Kronos, the biggest issue facing VR is, as they say, the fragmentation issue. It's the most urgent to solve in the VR community over the next 12 months or so. This is according to the Kronos group. They hope that their OpenXR is going to combat that fragmentation. And I love what they say at the end there. They are also democratically going about this. Now, that can lead to analysis paralysis, absolutely. You know, you got too many chefs in the kitchen, everybody's got an idea and you end up cooking absolutely nothing, bit bupkis, right? The idea here, according to them, it's not something they have to invoke often, but if there's a tie or unusual circumstance, they have a voting process in place for that group. So it'll be interesting. There are a lot of groups involved in this. Yes, some of the players are much bigger, may have louder voices, but uh, even with that voting system, when this thing really gets underway, because right now it's been a lot of talk and discussion, but when it really gets underway, are they going to be using that voting system as infrequently as they currently are? My bet would be no, they would likely invoke it far more, but we'll have to wait and see. Next story, the 2017 VR industry report. This is a collaboration report created annually. This will be the fourth or fifth one from Greenlight Insights and Road to VR course website where I get a lot of my news from. They hope on publishing the 2017 edition in spring on April 4th. What they plan on including is historical data on headset shipments, as well as forecasts all the way up through to 2026. Now, think whatever you want about forecasts. I personally take them with a big old grain of salt. Uh, 2016, in review, a perfect example versus what was forecasted, so there you go. The report is already available for pre-order 
and it's also going to include special in-depth sections on VR in China and Japan, some of the things that are definitely unique there. Now, this next article has to do with motion sickness. Not in the sense that we've covered motion sickness to date, which is basically through discussion of locomotion. That's usually when it comes up. People complaining about teleportation, smooth, mo that whole thing. This article from lifehacker.com is actually about, okay, yeah, we keep talking about motion sickness, but what the hell can we do about it? And they offer several suggestions. Now, before I go on with this, it's pretty obvious I'm not a medical doctor, no ambitions on being one. I'm also not a, uh, a Google medic, right? This is strictly from the article there input although there is one part I will comment on but we'll get to that so here's what they suggest you may have tried these you may think they're a crock or they simply may not work for you depending on the severity of your vertigo or motion sickness or whatever you happen to get in VR so the first suggestion is take plenty of breaks sit down and keep your head still that's pretty obvious I see that come up time and time again for those people, if they play in short bursts, Doom 3 was a perfect example of that. Some people with motion sickness were able to play it fine, but they had to do so in 15, 20-minute doses, no more. Some of them found throughout the course of the game, they were able to extend that period. Their body got more and more tolerant. For others, nothing changed, right? So that's one. The next is the other Captain Obvious stuff. Make sure your frame rates and your settings allow you to run the game at optimal speeds. My personal opinion is a lot of the eye candy that we've gotten used to on flat screen monitors doesn't have the same popping impact in VR. And yet a lot of those are resource hogs that really cripple your frame rate. Don't use them or go low, right? If you don't want to turn it off, just use them on low. That would be my suggestion. The next one is hacking your nervous system. I'm not going to list all the steps here, guys. You can read that um, at the link, but it's essentially something you've got to do with your fingers and hand and touching places. Supposedly, that makes the nausea go away. Doesn't seem too scientific for me, but again, what the hell do I know? Uh, some people claim it works. Another one that some people might not think of Watch what you eat beforehand. I know foods that I personally have a low tolerance for is oily, greasy stuff. Even with my biggest KFC craving, which is very infrequent, I'm not a fan, but you know, there's the odd time somebody else is eating it, you smell it. I can't have more than one piece. All that oil and grease just, I, it just makes me nauseous after one, right? So, Kind of obvious, oily, greasy, saturated meals. The reverse of that, do eat or drink stuff that is supposedly, you know, going to make it better. Like ginger candy, real ginger candy, uh, dr a ginger tea drink, that sort of thing. Now, the next one they didn't mention, I'm throwing it in. And I'm talking about over-the-counter medication done, you know, with a consultation with your physician in moderation, all of that. There is one that we use for my wife who does suffer from motion sickness when we've taken cruises in the past. It's called diphenhydramine, and it's basically an allergy medication that has about a billion uses. It's also one of the safest, not hepatoxic, meaning it's not bad for your liver, for anyone who doesn't know, and it's been around and studied forever. Not only is it a sleep aid, it helps combat nausea and sneezing and all that kind of stuff. So depending on how severe, that may be a solution. Again, moderation on that one. There's other stuff, obviously, Gravol um, and uh, Meclizine, etc. The next step, chill out, literally. And uh, what they mean is, get to some cold open your freezer stick your head in for a few seconds if it's cold outside stand in front of an open window if you're in a hot climate you have an air conditioner blast it put your face in front of that for a little bit 
the cold supposedly helps. And then the last step is just keep at it. Repetition. Find out what works for you and try to do that as frequently as you can. Again, lots of people, it's going to make absolutely no difference. Now, this uh, next story is a little strange, just kind of like the Oculus one earlier, in that it's from Sony showcasing a multiplayer VR experience, only they're not using the PlayStation VR, they're using the Vive. And not only one Vive, four Vives connected to a backpack PC. So they are at a trade show called uh, SXSW, which is uh, South by Southwest. So it's the Japanese division of Sony Music that is showcasing this. And players step on a wooden makeshift tram in the real world. And that comes to life in virtual reality. So that is all set up there. It's part of Sony's WOW factory, as it's called, which is a set of projects that, according to them, are developed with a spirit of open-minded and unbridled experimentation. It's kind of like, I think it was Google that has their 20% rule or whatever. You can spend 20% of your time each year working on something special to you. I might be off on the percentage, but that kind of an idea. Now, I will say this, having worked with a very large telecommunications company here in Canada called TELUS, just because a division shares the same name, they could communicate as frequently as if they were fierce competitors that never talked. In fact, we use them for our mobile phones, our bandwidth, and exchange email hosting, yet... You can never talk about something else with the other, nor can you call, open up a ticket, and have them know that you have all those other services. It's got to be explained every single time because they have no customer relationship software. So it just doesn't exist in that organization. Probably the same with Sony in that sense. Still, I wonder why they didn't use the PlayStation VR. Maybe it was the tracking I'd have to dig in a little deeper. All right, the last story. AMD's Radium Loom 360 tech aiming to make VR journalism more efficient. And essentially, this is a free tool set, open source from AMD. And it's to stitch together 360 degree videos. So a stitching framework. What I didn't realize, I knew the data requirements for 360 were intense. I didn't realize they were this intense. Listen to this. The amount of data that 360 degree video rigs generate is enormous. If you're stitching 24 HD cameras at 60 frames per second, you are generating around 450 gigabytes per minute. Think about that. You basically, a four terabyte drive or six terabyte minutes not even a half hour, not even 15 minutes, and you're done. So definitely some intense requirements there. Yeah, so the idea behind Radeon Looms is to make that process more efficient, faster, and based on this, free. All right, guys, that's it for the news on this Tuesday. As always, cheers.